Hello everyone and welcome back to Code with Italians. It's been a while. Uh, so uh, we're very happy to be back and we have a great episode today. We have Kirill with us. Hey Kirill, welcome Hello. to Code with Italians. Uh, do you want to introduce yourself? <laughs> um, my name is Kirill Grushnikov. I've been uh, on uh, the Android team since uh, around late 2009. And uh, pretty much like before that, uh, professionally, but also in college and also before that in high school, I've been always interested in putting pixels on the screen, uh, mostly on a desktop, but now also on mobile and sometimes on the web. So that's been my uh, kind of passion. And I'm really happy that uh, I also get to do it for a living. We, uh, well, I, I knew you from the pixel pushing days <laughs> back on, was it Google Plus? I think it was, right? Yes, those were the old <laughs> times. The uh, uh, 2000, uh, I want to say probably 10, 11, 12. Yeah, the very old days. Wow, it's been, what, 10 years? Jesus. <laughs> um, so today uh, we're going to be talking about shaders. But before we do that, I think... If I recall how this used to work, because I'm not entirely sure it's been a while, but I think now it's time for the even thing, right, Ivan? Yes, yes, <laughs> bravo, Sebastiano, you are correct. So uh, the even thing. So welcome, everybody. And we are going to just go through the, the usual um, announcement. So thank you for coming back and thank you for the support. Um, we have a few news. Um, Liz, lately, we started a new series of uh, subscriber-only content that you will be able to enjoy on uh, on YouTube uh, if you are contributing uh, to the the stream in any way um, from from Twitch or the coffee, whatever you do to support the stream, you will be able to enjoy the the content. If you want to support us. Uh, just have a look at the chat. I, I dropped a couple of links. You have, uh, if you have a subscription, uh, Amazon Prime subscription, you can subscribe for free to our channel every month, and this will support us and will allow us to to buy stickers, uh, stickers uh, that you can win uh, with our giveaways. Usually, we do giveaways every on every episode. If you are a subscriber you will be able to win this uh, holo angry pizza sticker that you cannot buy on the store. So this is only for subscribers that win the giveaway. Uh, on the store, you can buy the usual uh, Italian hand sticker and you can buy the, the pizza sticker. You can buy like a bunch of other things like the lettering and lately, uh, you're gonna love this. You will be able to buy also this one. So we released our first new uh, stickers, the YOLO driven development sticker that you can find already on our on our shop. And everything that goes into the the shop goes through the goal that we actually uh, we reached our second goal uh, the other day on coffee. And so the, the money that we, we got from you is going to be used to buy more swag and send you more swag. So it's like a swag machine kind of thing. Um, so thank you for the support and st uh, keep uh, supporting us. Stay with us and keep an eye on the chat. I'm going to drop the word for the giveaway. Uh, today we are also giving away an IntelliJ license. So, I mean... It doesn't get better than this. So this is the amount of talking they are going to do during this episode because I don't know anything about what <laughs> Kirill is going to explain and teach us. So I will be unable to do any kind of comment during the episode. So this is it. And I'm going to shut up and see you in a couple of hours. Well, but before you go, can I ask you something? Pineapples on pizza. Please. Yes or no? No. No, no, okay. we don't do that. We, so don't, we don't talk about that. The way I, that. I put it is not on my pizza. You can do whatever you want on your pizza. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, free, free will. I mean, I'm not judging. I'm just not eating. Uh, so jokes aside. Oh, we have spam already in the chat. Nice. Oh, that was fast. 
Yeah. <laughs> um, that was that was fast. I gotta keep so it. So thank you for being with us. And uh, yeah, let, let's start. I really, I mean it when I know very little about shaders, so like none. So an introduction is going to be very helpful for me. <laughs> okay. Uh, so should we start talking about shaders? Yes. So uh, first, what what are shaders? <laughs> first uh, step. Okay. So let's kind of like take a step back uh, and talk about how pixels get on screen. Uh, so without talking about any specific, let's say, platform, let's say Windows or Android or Mac OS, in general, um, if we talk about, let's say, Compose, right? Compose um, uh, and uh, different uh, composables that you have. So some composables are, like, they don't have any UI representation. So you pass state around, you pass maybe, uh, you do some logging, or, uh, some logging of uh, clicks or whatever. And then some composables put pixels on the screen. So it might be a button composable, a checkbox composable, and so on, right? And so from Compose, you go down to the uh, level of uh, Skia, which is um, uh, the uh, graphics library that has been chosen um, uh, on Android a long time ago, but also on desktop by uh, JetBrains uh, to do, the, um, uh, to do um, uh, the rendering on the screen. Then from Skia, it has a number of uh, backends. So Skia is uh, a kind of like this general cross-platform, general purpose graphics API or library to put pixels on screen. And then it has uh, backends. So it can render to uh, OpenGL, to Vulkan, or to Metal. And it also, by the way, can render to PDF and SVG. And so through that, uh, through one of those backends, it goes and talks to the uh, GPU driver. And uh, that GPU driver talks to the uh, GPU, which is a uh, piece of hardware that is responsible essentially um, for putting pixels on the screen. And so you have kind of like these layers, 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 layers. Uh, the closer you get to uh, the uh, hardware itself, the more specialized it uh, becomes. Uh, and so shaders are uh, pieces of code that you as a programmer can contribute at a lower level in the stack to participate in um, essentially like conversion of higher level primitives like rectangles, triangles, text, uh, to convert them to uh, essentially colors on the screen. So shader is a piece of code. Sometimes you can say uh, it's a small program, but shaders can be thousands of lines of code uh, that you can plug into uh, different parts of the rendering pipeline which can be on Android, which can be on the web, which can be on uh, Mac, which can be on um, your PlayStation and so on. So um, one thing I think is very cool about Skia is that it's incredibly cross-platform and incredibly portable. So mm -hmm. um, just to make an example, uh, it's not just Android, but you know, there's Chrome, there's Flutter, uh, what else? Well, Chrome OS technically doesn't count, uh, but I think you can also run Skia on .NET code, at least someone has made a wrapper for that. So there's a lot of, uh, of potential with learning how to do uh, shaders for Skia because then you can run them on any of those platforms, right? Uh, correct. So Skia started as an Android only thing and uh, over time it uh, grew to be used, uh, like you said, by Chrome, by Chrome OS, by Chromium, uh, by Firefox, uh, Flutter. And uh, another example, uh, you, uh, if you look at kind of like this cross-platform big uh, things is uh, LibreOffice that has switched recently to use uh, Skia for rendering their content. So what is nice, and there was a question here on Twitch, what is nice about uh, Skia is that it abstracts away the differences between not just different platforms, uh, such as macOS or iOS or uh, the web or Android or Windows. It abstracts away those differences. So you don't need to think about what kind of a hardware am I writing my code for? Uh, what um, what do I need to do in order to take advantage of multi-core setups of multi-core GPUs? Um, so it's kind of like 
Uh, same way as uh, GPU drivers abstract away differences between different specific NVIDIA drivers, uh, NVIDIA uh, graphic cards, then you go one level up and OpenGL, uh, the reason for it to exist, or one of the main reasons was to abstract away the differences between different GPU drivers, right? So as a, uh, let's say, game developer, you didn't need to target NVIDIA versus whatever versus whatever, right? And so the higher up you go, each layer is supposed to bring you a little bit more flexibility, uh, generalizing away, uh, well, not generalizing away, uh, abstracting away the differences in the underlying layers. And so if you choose Skia as your graphics library, it means that Skia is now responsible for doing the right thing on all the platforms that it supports, be it Windows, Android, Mac OS, iPhone, iPad, or whatever platform might uh, pop up in the future. And so uh, when the question is, are shaders cross-platform? So shaders are only as cross-platform as the pipeline that they are running in. So a Skia shader is cross-platform in the sense that Skia itself is cross-platform. So Skia takes care of being able to take that code of a Skia shader and translate it into the right set of instructions to be running on all the platforms and all the backends that it supports, be it Vulkan, Metal, OpenGL, PDF, and whatnot. Yeah, no, I think that's, uh, I was actually listening this morning to, uh, I'm gonna get the link right now, the latest episode of uh, Android Developers Backstage uh, the podcast uh, where they actually talk about Skia and uh, AGSL and maybe we can talk briefly about what AGSL is and then I'll come back to the actual question. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so again, taking a step back, uh, so SL in general states for a shader language and um, like there's this famous XKCD comic about uh, 13 competing standards and so the obvious uh, way forward is uh, to unify them all and then you get uh, 14 competing standards. So if you look at the um, kind of like the landscape of shading languages, uh, so there is uh, GLSL which is a shading language or shader language for OpenGL which essentially is um, kind of like the way you can see it is trying to find almost the lowest common denominator of what kind of code can you write that can be mapped to the underlying driver instructions to be running on as many different graphics cards as possible in as optimized way as possible, right? So if you look in general at the capabilities of shader languages, you will see that it's not general purpose programming languages. You don't really write like complicated loops or conditions or generics or whatever. So you have very specific, very targeted, specialized set of instructions that are supported uh, to work uh, essentially crunch uh, numbers and convert those numbers into uh, pixels, into colors, into uh, let's say alpha or whatever it might be, right? So uh, you have uh, GLSL, which is a shader language for OpenGL. You have uh, MSL, which is shader language for Metal. You have uh, WGSL, which is shader language for uh, WebGPU. And then you have this thing that was aiming to be the um, unifier, the HLSL, high level shader language. And now you have also Skia SL, SKSL, which is kind of like a variant of uh, GLSL uh, that since uh, Skia lives on top of uh, OpenGL or Vulkan or Metal, you don't, write G uh, you don't write in GLSL, you write in this very similar variant that is then mapped to the specific uh, shader language that runs on that specific backend, be it OpenGL, Metal, Vulkan and whatnot. Um, and so I do not think think that there is a page right now anywhere on the web that does any detailed comparison of the syntax differences or um, um, available, uh, so there are like number of available math functions that you can run, uh, like, you know, uh, do like trigonometry and stuff like that. 
I don't think there's any detailed uh, comparison between the different shader languages. In general, I would say maybe 90 to 95 percent of the time it looks identical. And then the rest, 5, 10 percent, is a little bit different, which is annoying, but this is the, um, this is the landscape right now. And so AGSL is uh, Android graphic uh, shader language, uh, which is yet another slight tweak of syntax and of capabilities that is um, targeted towards running um, uh, shaders that participate in the very specific rendering pipeline of the Android uh, system. So the mental model is uh, GLSL is the shading language for OpenGL, and that's, let's say, the, the granddad of AGSL. Uh, from there, they derived SKSL, which is pretty much a subset of GLSL, correct? Uh, I would say uh, if you look at um, uh, kind of like the layers, so uh, AGSL uh, is mapped to the underlying, uh, well, I'm not sure about the exact implementation, but um, uh, you have the uh, uh, OpenGL backend of Skia. Then on top of that, you have Ski itself. And then on top of that, you have Android or mm. desktop or whatever it might be, right? So I would say that AGSL lives above SKSL, right? Mm. But uh, as far as um, how those specific instructions get converted, I don't want to mislead the listeners. So mm. I'm not sure if AGSL gets converted to SKSL and then that gets converted to uh, mm. Vulkan or OpenGL um, uh, language instructions. Got it. But the idea is still that it's a snippet, a fragment of code that you put in a string and then gets compiled on the fly and uploaded to the GPU, correct? Uh, correct. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, when it runs, it depends on what kind of a graphics pipeline uh, do you have, right? So there are all these different kind of shaders. Uh, so uh, if we're talking about, in general, um, uh, kind of like general purpose rasterizing uh, pipelines. Uh, so to put some 2D or 3D graphics on the screen, be it in games, in apps, on your phone, on your tablet. Uh, so you would have your vertex shader, your geometry shader, your pixel shader. In Skia, there's only one kind of shader so far. So they're just called shaders. Uh, but in general, an interesting thing for me at least is that shaders do not have to be um, operating on uh, pixels. So um, I think it started around maybe um, eight, 10 years ago where graphic cards have become so powerful that a lot of people started considering to use them for general purpose, heavy math computations. So what happens is that you can run your uh, heavy computation, be it train your neural network, run some sort of machine learning algorithm, mine some bitcoins. So you can offload that to a multi-core GPU where the input is a set of numbers, the output is another set of numbers. You write uh, what is called uh, usually compute shaders. They do not put pixels on the screen. It doesn't go to the uh, GPU um, memory that is mapped to the screen pixels. But as long as um, it follows this highly specialized and highly powerful set of instructions that can run very quickly and in a highly parallelized way on the GPU, that's another kind of shader. Uh, talking about kinds of shaders, so uh, Mark was actually asking if render script kernels were a type of shader or maybe something different. Uh, I do not want to mislead uh, because I did not look at the um, uh, at the shaders uh, back then. Uh, I was working uh, uh, and I'm back now uh, on the uh, Google Play Store uh, team. And uh, there was uh, one thing that we did uh, some time ago, uh, maybe uh, seven, eight years ago, that did use some OpenGL, uh, where it was this thing where you could um, 
explore uh, like you start from a music artist or a music album and it's kind of like this canvas where you click around and it's, it's almost like an infinite graph that connects different artists to different genres to different albums and so you could browse uh, you could browse it it was a passion project of uh, one of the developers on the team back then and that was pretty much the only time we uh, had um, kind of like dug deeper uh, kind of like under the Android UI toolkit APIs. Well, that render script is a UI toolkit API, but uh, dug deeper into uh, the graphics stack. Mm. So I don't want to mislead uh, about uh, how render script, um, if it's a shader or not. So someone is saying that render script kernels are a type of compute shaders that can also run on CPU. Um, but yeah, I think Generally speaking, you probably use render script to, you know, render uh, visual stuff. So probably use it more uh, like a pixel shader. I'm not saying saying that it was a pixel shader, but the, the functionality was the same where um, you get a function that is called for every pixel and you can pass values to that. And that outputs something that generally is uh, the, the color of the pixel uh, that is called for. And this can be generalized to pixel shaders and to uh, SKSL and AGSL as well, right? Uh, probably maybe the syntax is a little bit different. Um, and uh, maybe uh, with uh, Skia, you have a little bit more optimization to, um, to run on modern hardware. And maybe also with Skia, you get a little bit more portability to uh, get that code in some slightly modified form to run uh, beyond Android. Mm -hmm. So we've been talking a lot about uh, shaders, kind of shaders, Skia, whatever. Show us something. <laughs> uh, OK, so uh, we have, uh, let's, uh, let me sh um, uh, let's switch to my screen, maybe? Yes, on done. Uh, OK, so this one is, uh, if you go to shaders.skia.org, this is the uh, playground. Uh, and when you load it, this is the um, uh, kind of like, I guess, canonical example or introduction example. Um, and uh, so this thing is kind of like three-dimensional mesh of uh, like infinite honeycomb, I guess. Um, and also, by the way, this thing, if you go to uh, the uh, release notes uh, of uh, Android 13, uh, well, Android 13 hasn't been released yet, but uh, it is in. Um, uh, it has been announced, um, and so uh, you see this uh, same um, intro uh, shader uh, being used here to introduce uh, programmable shaders in uh, Android 13. And so this is uh, one example of what you can do, uh, which uh, is a little bit demo-y, uh, but uh, a little bit more realistic example is. Uh, let me see which one was it. Uh, I think number five. Let's try number five and see. Let's see number five. It might be six or seven. I think it's five. Okay, let's see. So uh, this is um, um, Compose uh, Desktop, uh, which is uh, running a, a piece of um, uh, Skia uh, shader which has, uh, so this is a regular button. Uh, so when you move the mouse over the button, it kind of like lights up in um, this golden yellow. And this is a uh, the same button where a custom shader is used to create this outside glow. So the button itself, uh, if you look at the code, the button itself is uh, defined exactly the same as in here, except that if I go, um, uh, go down to here, uh, here, it is using a uh, Compose uh, modifier, uh, modifier.graphics layer, and it passes a um, runtime shader uh, with the code um, over here. Uh, and at runtime, uh, let's go back in here, at runtime, this shader runs um, uh, and uh, gets uh, inputs. So you have these inputs uh, the glow color, which is our yellow, and also the uh, glow amount, 
which is uh, how much uh, of the glow you want to do. So you have this nice rollover effect. And uh, what happens is essentially, like we discussed before, I am contributing a, a small piece of code to be running on every single pixel uh, of this button and around this button. And that code uh, essentially decides how much of this yellow to contribute on top of what already is uh, coming from uh, this uh, background. Uh, and so this is a little bit closer to kind of like more boring uh, application UIs. And of course you can do something a little bit more interesting and we can dive uh, into this code a little bit later. Uh, so this is, uh, so this is a canvas over here, a dark gray, almost black canvas uh, with a few uh, colored uh, circles. And then on top of that, we apply uh, a, um, a composite shader that does blurring of the background of these circles. It also does this slight white uh, translucent gradient that starts in the top left corner and goes down to the uh, bottom right. It applies a little bit of a noise texture over here. And also if you look around uh, the uh, outline over here and around the outline over here, it also applies a drop shadow uh, around the whole thing. And so this is um, a few examples of uh, shaders, not for writing games, not for running um, complicated 3D um, uh, rendered scenes, but a little bit closer to add a little bit of texture, to add a little bit of blur, to add a little bit of uh, maybe playfulness to your UIs. And one final piece that I want to point out here is that this section in the Android um, 13 introduction that talks about programmable shaders, it also talks about three specific places where Android itself is using the shaders. So one is for ripple effects. And by the way, each link, if you go into it, each link uh, goes, let's click on this one. It goes and um, uh, links you to the specific shader that is being used. So you can see exactly how the platform is using uh, its own APIs. Uh, so we have the ripple effects, we have the blur and the stretch over scroll. Um, and what is interesting here is for me to kind of like the common thread between these three is that it takes something that exists on the screen. So the ripple effect is applied on top of a button, on top of a clickable area. Blur again is applied on top of some content of the screen. And the same for stretch over scroll. You have, um, you have your uh, scrollable content and when you get to the edge, top, bottom, left or right, it stretches that content. And so this is kind of a uh, unified thread on why you would want to use, uh, why or where you would want to use shaders. Got it, got it, got it. Yeah, I, I, so the, the reason why uh, we invited you in the first place is that you've been playing around with uh, skia shaders for a while. Uh, mm -hmm. And even like I've been keeping an eye on the Artemis um, uh, repository for uh, for some time and also seeing what you were tweeting and mm -hmm. it it seems like shaders are can be as simple or as complicated as you want like you can do a lot of things with them but there must be some limitations to what you can do is there anything that is fairly obvious um so I would say that my particular interest is in uh, the world of more, let's say, boring business desktop applications, mm -hmm. right? So let me switch uh, back to uh, here, right? And so let me run, uh, I think, this one. Okay, so this is what I started with. I started playing with... Um, um, how to uh, do a little bit of textures, right? So it used to be uh, uh, way more popular, let's say uh, five, six, maybe eight years ago before everything became flat. So we had this uh, skeuomorphic design uh, on desktop, on the web, uh, on uh, mobile devices where uh, designers and uh, developers were almost borrowing real world uh, textures. 
be it leather, be it uh, uh, maybe uh, wooden textures, maybe um, uh, maybe uh, marble textures and whatnot, right? And so today, it is, uh, today it's a little bit um, uh, kind of like out of uh, out of fashion, but maybe it is. Um, I think it has a little bit of a um, like you don't want it to, to be in your face, right? You don't need the texture to be drawing the user's attention away from your uh, main content, from your buttons, from your uh, maybe canvas, from your uh, toolbars and whatnot, right? But what I think for me personally is that a little bit of a texture can create a useful and usable separation of different parts of your UI where you can apply maybe something like a noise or maybe a little bit of this uh, emulated brush metal texture and maybe colorize it a little bit, depending on uh, the visual language of your app. And what I want to see is how we can incorporate this tool into the larger collection of tools at our disposal. So it's not meant to replace every single other tool that I have. I want it to be yet another useful and usable tool. I want to understand its limitations. I want to understand its strong sides and then treat it as yet another tool at my disposal. Not better or worse in general, but better at some tasks. Yeah, you probably don't want to write uh, a shader when you don't need to because uh, you still need like, uh, besides the fact that it's a new language that you need to learn, uh, mm -hmm. but it, it also can be more complicated uh, to take care of even and it's something that Mark was actually asking in the chat a few minutes ago. Like, uh, the, the question is, how do you even debug shaders, right? Uh, okay, so we have a couple of questions here. So first of all, Everything is a shader. <laughs> so if you go down low enough in the rendering pipeline, everything is a shader. So if I do, let me go back to Firefox and I have this. Um, so this is the uh, source code uh, from um, uh, Compose Material 3 checkbox, right? So if you look at uh, what this composable does, if you look at the top level checkbox composable, you go down here and it has uh, a little bit of um, handling um, uh, the user interaction with a click with the um, uh, with the interaction source. And then it goes down in here, a uh, little bit over here where it does transitions. So where you go and click it on and off, it does this nice transitions between the different colors. Then you have the uh, handling of colors that are taken from the material theme. And then this is kind of like the graphics core if you will, of the checkbox, which is a canvas that draws a box and a check mark. The box is drawn with the uh, canvas dot draw round rectangle, and the check mark is drawn with the uh, canvas dot draw path. So if you go down into the specific implementation of draw path and draw round rect, if you go down to skia, and you go down to uh, how it maps these APIs to the underlying backends, be it OpenGL, Vulkan, or Metal, everything will be a shader. So the question is, do I want to always use a shader or do I want to use a little bit more higher level abstracted components, if you will, or primitives such as path or rounded rectangle? So that's number one. Um, uh, when uh, do you want, uh, like, do I want to use a shader? You, if you know it or if you don't know it, you are using shaders. The question is, do you have to be forced to use a shader? And the answer is no. Shaders is just another tool. And uh, your second question about debugging, in general, it is not the best um, story ever. Um, we are, uh, we have grown uh, to be accustomed to a lot of uh, debugging tools in uh, Visual Studio, in uh, Xcode, in uh, IntelliJ, um, uh, different um, IntelliJ um, IDEs um, to uh, debug, to, uh, com uh, to take snapshots, to uh, uh, sometimes even go back and replay uh, certain parts of code. 
So with uh, shaders, it is a little bit more complicated. Uh, what uh, uh, the shaders playground provides, you can click over here on this debug button, and it takes you to something like this, where you can step uh, you can step in and out if you have multiple functions. And over here on the right, it's going to show you the current um, uh, the current uh, uh, values of the specific variables. I don't think, yeah. So you cannot uh, double click and change those uh, uh, values the way you can do in IntelliJ. Uh, and also what you are running here is not exactly the same snippet that you are running inside your um, uh, Skia shader uh, in Compose. So you can kind of like get maybe 95, 99% there by debugging uh, bits and pieces of your uh, overall shader in here and then copy paste it back to your kind of like main uh, source code uh, over here and hope that you have debugged, uh, uh, I guess, enough of it. And if you haven't. <laughs> uh, well, so yes, so this is uh, the painful part. The painful part is that we have grown accustomed to the richness and variety of uh, debugging tools in our main IDEs. And as far as shaders go, maybe it's because they are running way lower down the stack. Uh, maybe it's because so far they have been um, kind of like this specialized niche and uh, the uh, providers of uh, tools such as JetBrains or Microsoft haven't felt that the market is um, deep enough or wide enough to um, uh, to warrant a uh, deeper investment into these tools. Maybe it's because there's a wider variety of shader languages. Um, I don't really have a good answer here, but as far as debugging, it is, you can't even do print. Like I can't put print in here uh, after this line. Uh, this code runs on uh, the GPU somewhere very deep in the uh, graphics pipeline. Uh, and like I can't, I can't put a breakpoint in here. I can double click here. This is just a string. It is uh, syntax highlighted from a, a GLSL um, uh, plugin in IntelliJ. But otherwise, I can't put a breakpoint in here. I can't put a print statement in here. So it is, um, it is a little bit painful. So maybe one thing you could do is try to. Uh, to the next best closest thing to print line, which maybe is, I don't know, color some pixel red or, or something. Uh, that is correct. That is correct. And what you can do is, so if you go in here, for example, right, and you have your shader, so what you can do is um, uh, you can, let's say, um, instead, of, um, see, uh, instead of five, let's put 10 and see what happens. Uh, looks pretty much the same. Let's do maybe 0.8. Let's see what happens then. 0.8 looks the same. Let's do maybe one here. Or maybe it needs to be saved first. Uh, well, at some point, let's do maybe uh, 12. I wonder at some point it should start looking different. Do you need to use the rewind button maybe? Um, okay. So I changed this here from, uh, I don't remember what I changed actually. <laughs> yeah, let me reload this. Oh, okay. Whoa. So uh, so this right now, I put, I think, time uh, times uh, 100 instead of 10. Uh, okay, so it looks like all of my changes have been applied in one single swoop, right? And uh, so you do see kind of like, well, it's obviously different, right? Um, and uh, so yes, in uh, in something uh, a little bit simpler, if I go back to um, if I go back to uh, my uh, example of doing the glow uh, of doing the glow on this button uh, over here, no, not this one, of this button over here. So what I can do, I can uh, instead of passing the uh, color, instead of passing the color, I can set this glow color to uh to something so let's say here if i do um uh, just glow amount so i'll i'll leave it as glow amount but instead of this i'll just do one dot uh oh 
and then pure red. So do zero, zero, and then I'll do zero, zero here, okay? And if I run it again, let's see that it should pick up the uh, glow itself to be a uh, pure red. So let's see, hopefully it will work. Yes, so in here, I can kind of like you said, I can try and uh, separate uh, kind of like or split the uh, bigger logic into smaller pieces. So over here in this particular case, I would be only interested to see that the uh, glow uh, is uh, animating to its full uh, force or to its full strength and then animates back without worrying that it is the right color. And then I can uh, plug in uh, the color back uh, and verify that the color is correct and also that the um, uh, rollover amount is correct. Got it. So um, can we go through this? Um, actually, before we do that, how like do you need to do anything in your in the IDE to make it understand the, the shading language? Does it do it automatically? You need to inject uh, it. So uh, that was a recommendation from Roman Guy mm -hmm. uh, when I posted a little bit of the code in uh, Kotlin Slack. Uh, and I said that there is no syntax highlighting. And uh, like you mentioned, um, the uh, shader snippet is a string. So this whole thing that starts from here, the uh, triple uh, quotation marks uh, uh, and ends over here. So this whole thing is just one string. It is not compiled at compile time. It is passed at runtime to Skia, which compiles it and does whatever uh, syntax checks uh, and throws whatever sometimes very cryptic errors. So let's say if I do this in here, so this will be a little bit more um, uh, a little bit more straightforward. So it's going to crash, but it's going to crash with um, uh, with uh, something useful in here. So it says here also you can see line 16 is not exactly line 16 here, right? This is line uh, mm. 83. So this is line 16 within the bigger snippet, right? So you kind of like need to like, I guess, get used to how sometimes unproductive these um, uh, messages are. And these messages are only thrown, uh, these errors are thrown at runtime. Uh, and another example of how sometimes unproductive it can be, let me see, I think it's this one, uh, where I'm combining multiple, uh, yes. So I will, so let's say if I do this one, so uh, I'm using the same name uh, for two uh, shader children. So what will happen? I was looking at the code of uh, Ski itself, how it parses it. I think it's going to throw null pointer. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Yes. So this is the only thing that you get. Okay. Nice. <laughs> it's, not, it's not telling you. It's not telling you that the uh, sure. shader names have to be unique. It's not telling you that. So what you would need to do, you would need to go into the uh, native code, uh, Skia code, not native code, into the Skia C++ code behind this uh, binding, image filter dot make runtime shader, and you will need to see what are the conditions under which it can throw null pointer exception. And uh, essentially, you are debugging the code by looking at it, right? So um, uh, you would go somewhere in here. Uh, let's see, what was it? Image filter make runtime shader. Let's see, is it here? Uh, it's probably in, um, oh, where is it? I'm scrolling, so uh, let's see. Runtime shader, uh, runtime effect, gradient shader, somewhere in here. I don't remember. The well, one. it doesn't really matter. Like, uh, mm -hmm. let's not waste time on this. But what happens is that this is this can be your daily routine if you are writing a lot of uh, shader snippets, uh, which is not ideal, but um, uh, it is how it is. Uh, well, at least for now. And uh, as far as uh, the second part of your question, the highlighting, so what I have here, I have a, a GLSL plugin. Let's see, where is it installed? Uh, so it's called GLSL support. It is uh, being actively developed. If you go in here to the plugin homepage, 
Uh, let's see. Oh, it's going to open Chrome, not this one. Uh, okay, so you will see that it is, uh, it has a GitHub uh, over here, source code. And uh, you will see that some, uh, some source code is a little bit old, but um, some source code, uh, they're, still, uh, they're still working on it. So once you have that plugin installed, if you open the .glsl file, it will apply the correct highlighting. And otherwise, if you have your snippet, you need to use this uh, IntelliJ annotation language. And uh, you need to pass the, um, I guess, language name GLSL. So going back to what I mentioned a little bit earlier, there are different flavors of shader languages. Uh, there are uh, GLSL, Metal, MSL, uh, WebGPU uh, shader language, high-level shader language. So technically, this is not GLSL. This is SKIESL, right? But since it shares a lot of kind of like structure and syntax, the plugin mostly does the right thing. And when I say mostly, uh, if I go and uh, this code that I took, let's just reload this page. If you take this code and if you copy paste it, uh, that plugin is going to complain on this particular part, X, Y, 1. So it's going to say, uh, I think it's here. Let's see here. It's going to say that one is an unknown type. So uh, the plugin does a decent job at doing highlighting, but when the plugin complains, it doesn't mean that your code is not going to run correctly at runtime. So I actually oh. go even. What do you do want to say? Oh, I'm I'm one. I'm I'm wondering. It, it feels like um, you really need to be committed to work with this uh, technology and from a language point of view, from a debuggable point of view, developer experience, somebody will call it developer experience. It can be um, a bit a bit painful at the beginning. It's definitely unfamiliar for me. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how composable are uh, shaders and if they are uh, modular and composable, I imagine like, like a stackable uh, series of composable uh, of yeah, composable shaders. Uh, do we have collections of you know general purpose or ready-made uh, shaders like you know the blur one? The blur one feels very reusable, right? Mm -hmm. oh, the ones that you you build for the example there is there was like a gradient. A shader or something like a drop shadow as well. Mm -hmm. so are you aware of collections that will ease up the pain for you know newcomers or people that want to try to play around with shaders? Mm. So that's a great question. And if you look at Skia, uh, you do not always have to drop down to this level of writing uh, shaders uh, as. Um, I guess, explicit uh, instructions. So if I go back to, um, let's do SK image filters. OK, so in Skia, they call it uh, image filters. But each filter is essentially backed by a shader. So uh, there's a uh, Skia filter called um, uh, Blur, which is uh, wrapped in a Compose for Desktop in a Kotlin-friendly way. So that if all you want to do is to apply a blur, you do not need to write a uh, special shader for it. So what you would do, you specify how much uh, blur across uh, the two axes, X and Y, uh, you want to have. You need to specify tile mode is essentially what happens at the edges uh, of your um, uh, visuals. Do you want to clamp it? Do you want to repeat it and whatnot? So there are maybe half a dozen, uh, not half a dozen, maybe a couple dozen uh, different um, uh, useful common filters uh, that you use uh, straight uh, from uh, Skia APIs themselves. 
another one is uh, if I go back to uh, this demo, let's see if I have it running. Uh, this one, the noise, is not a shader that I wrote. If you look at uh, how it is implemented, it is a shader dot make fractal noise. So in this particular case, Kia developers decided that it is a useful enough, common enough uh, shader, common enough effect that they want to provide it out of the box. And then something like uh, this one, which is essentially a composite of multiple uh, visuals, is uh, something that maybe you can combine out of existing uh, building blocks, like uh, the blur, like the uh, drop shadow, uh, like the gradient, or maybe you would want to go a little bit deeper into how precise uh, of a control you want to have over every single pixel, right? And so to your question, it's going to be your own personal decision on how familiar or comfortable you are with writing a custom shader, or maybe if you want to get close enough to the uh, target visuals by combining one or more of the uh, built-in uh, image filters. I guess this is and, also... I mean, so go ahead, go ahead, even. No, no, please, Sebastian. Uh, no, 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 please go ahead. It's fine. <laughs> uh, I, I, I was... Hupoli. No, no, no. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, because I'm I'm curious because now I I see the, you know, at least the approachability for somebody like me that it's not into this kind of stuff. But as far as I understand, I mean, the one that you are showing, the noise shader, it looks just like a Kotlin function, a couple of parameters, and then I pass mm -hmm. it to a um, to a modifier, right? right. That, that right. was that was the gist of it. Uh, either a modifier or, in some cases, uh, if you do not... Okay, so uh, this is an interesting separation. So uh, this one, <clears throat> uh, I think even this one. So I have, my, um, uh, I have my shader over here, which is a Kotlin binding to the underlying SKI APIs. I have my shader here. And then what I can do, I can over, I think over here, uh, let me see. Okay, over here, what I uh, so I create this shader. So this is binding to the Skia API. Uh, then I uh, wrap it with a shader brush, and shader brush is uh, comes from uh, Compose, so it is part of the Compose.ui package. What I can do with this brush is I can pass it to the draw rect API of the Compose canvas. Uh, and that brush is going to be used to uh, uh, to uh, uh, draw, uh, which one is it? This one, this one. So each one of these six uh, squares is uh, drawn by using a Compose brush, right? So this, yes, it is using a shader under the hood, but there are different ways to integrate your shader into your Compose um, uh, into your Compose uh, structure. So one way is with that graphics layer Compose uh, modifier, which is the most powerful way. Uh, but a simpler way is uh, this one where you just want to fill a certain area, which might be a square, a rectangle, a circle, or maybe a path without changing the underlying pixels. And what do I mean by changing the underlying pixels? This effect, the blur, the uh, gradient, the noise, is applied on top of the existing content uh, in the canvas. So in here, I do need to uh, go a little bit deeper into the Skia APIs, into the Skia API bindings, what I call runtime shaders, in order to be able to apply a shader on top of the existing content of this canvas node. And so, you want to get yourself familiar with the available APIs in Skia and in Compose to kind of like get a little bit more familiarity with which tool is best suited for a particular job. So uh, what I was going to say earlier is that uh, I don't know how much uh, that will work, 
but uh, given that SCIA uh, SL, SKSL is fairly similar to uh, GLSL, and I mean, all shading languages are fairly similar. I think you can use stuff from uh, websites like uh, Shader Toy, where oh. uh, you have uh, you have a collection of things that people have made, uh, and uh, you can see the crazy stuff you can do with uh, with shaders. I don't know if you want to show something uh, while you're screen sharing, Kirill. Uh, but... uh, so, uh, okay, so in general, I have to warn you that shaders can be pretty dense in a sense that you can achieve a lot with very few lines of math. Uh, so I'm not sure if I have my favorite, well, but even here, right? So even here, this one, if you look just at the visuals on the left and you ask yourself how complex is it going to be for me to do this with uh, existing Android APIs or with existing Compose APIs? This looks pretty complicated, right? And yet, when you look on the right, it's not even 15 lines of code. It's like from line two to line, like all in all, you have four lines here and then you have another six lines here. So everything on the left is achieved with only 10 lines of code. Now, the Problematic part with it is that every single line is very dense. It is not commented. So you don't really know what exactly it is that every single line does here. So you can go to shaders.skia.org. You can go to shader toy. You can start copy pasting stuff. You can definitely play around. So if you go to shader toy and let's do something like, uh, well, I don't know, uh, let's say blur. Let's see if we can find something with blur, something. Uh, OK, so let's do this one. So let's open and see. So this is a little bit more complicated. So this is 250 lines of code. So what you can do here, you can definitely start playing around. Uh, you can start playing around. Uh, let's see, where is the main function? I guess main image. Uh, you can start playing around with each line. You can start commenting them out. You can start uh, changing the um, uh, whatever, like, you know, uh, numbers or um, uh, multiplications or whatever functions are called. At some point, you start asking yourself, what is it exactly that this particular line does? And it gets complicated because of the tendency of shader code to be very compact and yet very powerful. So um, there's a lot of examples out there. There are some books out there. Um, I would say that shaders in general encourage, uh, encourage compactness over readability. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Um, and it's all the more impressive if you think that all this stuff is done on a, essentially on a per pixel basis, right? Like this, this uh, correct. shader. Correct. So this is another example. Uh, let me just see if I can run this. I think this is the shader demo too. So this is something that I copy pasted almost as is. So this is uh, something, some sort of a fractal texture. Well, not fractal, but like kind of like this. Um, uh, natural texture that gets this uh, colorizing and uh, highlights. And if you look in here, shader two, uh, it is a little bit uh, more, um, uh, more uh, a little bit longer. So it goes from line 46 to line, uh, to line uh, 118, which is about 70 lines. So uh, what you can do here, you can start I guess commenting out different parts, playing with a uh, different math, and see uh, how exactly, uh, well, hopefully how exactly uh, each uh, piece uh, is being done. And uh, to your point, yes. So this function main gets called on every single uh, uh, coordinate uh, in the image uh, or in the buffer. And uh, what you return is you return a color for that pixel. So you don't get the whole image as the input, and you don't return all the uh, the entire output as a one single buffer or one single image. So you get one pixel or one coordinate, and you return one color. 
it is very powerful in the sense that this snippet, this shader can be taken and it can run in parallel on however many cores in that GPU on your device, be it a phone, a tablet, a laptop, uh, the uh, GPU driver can partition this task into however many um, subtasks uh, you have. And this is what allows for that smooth animation to happen in real time uh, without stuttering because it is not running on the CPU, it is running on the GPU, it is running on, on parallel on multiple pixels, which also means that even though you can technically get access to multiple, uh, like when you are asked to return a color for the specific coordinate, you can look at multiple pixels in your input. But the more pixels you look at, the more expensive the overall computation, the overall shader is. So when you're talking about something like blur, and I have, um, let me see, where do I have blur? Ah, over here. So in order for blur to happen, you cannot look at just one input pixel. So what happens with blur is you look at your own pixel, but you also look at the pixels around it. You look one, uh, one above, one below, one to the side, uh, one to the left, one to the right. And the more blur you want to apply, the more pixels you need to be looking at around you. So it gets expensive. Uh, with effects like blur, with effects uh, like stretching or doing some sort of like, you know, waves or whatever you might have where multiple input pixels are contributing themselves to the uh, single output pixel. So you do want, it's not just how many lines of code you have in the shader, it's also how many input pixels you are looking at and how much logic you are putting into those lines. So a 10 line shader snippet is not necessarily more optimized than a 100 line shader snippet. Got it. Uh, there's a couple of questions from the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, I think while we're looking at shader code, uh, mm -hmm. can you explain like the uh, return? Like in this case, for example, uh, well, Maybe in the shader too. Uh, yeah, know. let's. Uh, okay, so uh, let's go yeah. to uh, to here. Okay. Yep. Maybe we can go through this from top to bottom because I think we also need to explain what uniforms are. Uh, yes, and there was another question on how you pass a color into the uh, into the shader. So uh, uniforms are a um, name. I'm not sure who chose it and why it was chosen to be the name uniform. Essentially, it's a parameter. A uniform is a parameter that you pass into your shader. So uh, if we look at uh, this one, this one doesn't get any parameters. This one doesn't get any parameters. It looks at the coordinates of the current pixel. It looks at the overall resolution, how big your uh, canvas is. And then it does a bunch of uh, trigonometry and um, whatever, let's call it magic. Uh, to uh, create this uh, three-dimensional, um, uh, I guess, maze or a honeycomb, right? Uh, but if you do want to pass um, some parameters into your shader, uh, this is what, what is called uniforms. Uh, you can pass uh, integers and floats. Uh, if you want to, uh, to pass colors, uh, the colors are passed over here if I open this one. So this is a glow color that I want to say Let's run it again. That I want to say that I want the glow to be yellow color. So this is my uniform glow color. I want the glow to be uh, this much. Uh, I mean, how, um, uh, how big uh, the glow is, not how strong it is, but how big it is in pixels which means like uh, how, uh, how much of the glow do you see outside of the button. Then max glow amount is how strong the glow is. So it kind of like fades in when I move the mouse over the button and then it fades out. So this is my max glow amount. Uh, the uh, width, height and radius are floats that essentially define the shape uh, of the overall button. So what I'm doing here, I'm deciding what information does the shader need 
to uh, create the visuals. So you can pass uh, individual integers and floats. You can pass um, uh, you can pass colors as uh, vec4, and vec4 is just uh, a vector, uh, which is kind of like an array, I guess, a float array with uh, four um, four uh, entries in it. So you have vec2, vec3, and vec4, and there uh, there's also support for two by two, <coughs> excuse me, three by three, and four by four matrices. And in addition, it also allows to pass other shaders as an input. So over here, my input shader is the button itself, mm -hmm. like the visuals of the button. And what I'm doing in this particular shader, I'm applying the blur on the, uh, not the blur, the glow on the outside of this thing. So essentially what I'm using the, um, uh, let's see, uh, I think this example is a little bit more, um, uh, uh, is a little bit more uh, interesting. So I need to know the color of the underlying pixel in here, so that when I apply drop shadow, I essentially shift that purple towards a darker version of that purple or towards the black. So in order to be able to shift it, I need to know what is the color of the pixel that I'm shifting, right? That I'm applying the drop shadow on top of. So this is why this particular shader is going to get a uh, shade, another shader uh, as its input. So you need so, to do the color blending by yourself, essentially, in this case. Uh, correct. So what happens is over here. So what happens over here? So uh, let's uh, let's take this uh, one step at a time, right? So and this is what I did in the uh, blog post that uh, I wrote. Right, yes. So if you go in here, well, we can actually uh, go over this, uh, over this, and uh, um, I'll uh, I'll talk uh, about the uh, specific pieces. Uh, in this composite shader, right? So first of all, in here, I need to decide where the shader is applied. So there's kind of like the background layer. So this is the canvas with the uh, colored circles. And then there's the foreground layer, which is kind of like this emulated uh, translucent white credit card. Uh, that has a little bit of uh, color effects applied uh, on its uh, on its border. Uh, it has this noise, and then it has text, translucent text on top of it. So the blur is applied to the circles. Uh, the blur is not applied to the noise. The blur is not applied to the text. So I want to understand kind of like the, uh, I guess, the hierarchy of content in here that I have my background, which are the circles. And then this thing, there's the background of the card, which applies the uh, texture, the noise, the blur on top of this background. And then there's the foreground of the card. So with that, I start, uh, uh, this is a simple uh, uh, canvas, uh, sorry, not even canvas. Uh, this is a uh, uh, box composable uh, from uh, Compose. Uh, which says uh, fill uh, the whole area uh, with uh, this color, which is almost pure black, but not quite. It is a little bit of a darker, uh, darker uh, gray. Now we add the circles. Uh, for the circles, we can do them as shaders, but it's much nicer to use uh, the draw circle APIs uh, from the Compose Canvas. Uh, so we don't like, again, technically, Anything and everything can be a shader, but it doesn't have to be. So here we can use uh, higher level primitives. Now, uh, I want to apply a blur. Uh, if I go back up here, I want to apply a blur, but not to the entire area. I want to apply blur only in the area of this card, right? So for this, so for this over here, I say I have my content. And then I pass the blur shader, which is which is this image filter dot make blur. So in this particular case, I say I do not want to re-implement something that Skia already has. Right. So uh, this is uh, my uh, uh, the beginning of my shader that I have my content, which gives me every single pixels uh, every single pixel from those colored circles, and then I have my blur shader. I want to pass two uniforms that specify how big my rectangle is, where it is on the screen, and also the uh, corner radius. 
So I cannot pass a random Kotlin data class in here. So if your uh, shape is defined by a data class, you have to almost like break apart that data class into something that can be passed into your shader. So in this particular case, I break it apart into the rectangle itself, into the, into the bounding box, and the radius, the corner radius of uh, this uh, bounding box. So the, the so rectangle in this case, you've broken down the, the graphics rectangle you would get in, uh, in Compose into mm -hmm. the X and Y coordinates of the top left and bottom right. Uh, yes, so this uh, VEC4 is a way to pass four floats in a single, as a single unit, right? So rectangle in this particular case is going to be X, Y of the top left corner and width height. Ah, okay. And then I treat it, I, tr I treat those four parts as X, Y, width and height. Uh, and the corner radius I pass as a separate uh, uniform. Uh, now this is, uh, it's called a sign distance function. What I want to know, if I go back, what I want to know is what, uh, when should I apply the blur? I want to apply the blur only on the inside of this rectangle. I want to leave all of these pixels on the outside. I want to leave them untouched. I don't want to blur them, right? So this is a helper function. This is a helper function, and again, it is a little bit uh, dense. If you go to the link in this code, uh, it has a uh, link to uh, the YouTube video, which is about uh, five, six minutes, where uh, the uh, person who wrote this function explains exactly uh, the purpose of every single part of this math. Uh, and then what I do is, uh, I say, okay, how close uh, is my pixel, uh, sorry, where is my pixel to the relation uh, in, uh, in the rel uh, relative to uh, this rounded rectangle? If I'm on the outside of the rectangle, I just return uh, the color uh, of uh, the original color of the pixel, which might be uh, that black fill or which might be that uh, colored um, uh, the color that comes from one of the circles. Otherwise, if I'm on the inside of the um, uh, of the uh, rounded rectangle, I am going to apply a blur shader or blur filter at this coordinate uh, and return that. Mm. So the end result is this. The end result is that all the pixels on the inside of the rounded rectangles are blurred and all the pixels on the outside remain the same. So the sign distance field is just a mathematical mm -hmm. representation of the shape that you want to feel with the effect, right? In this uh, case. So sign distance function, let's open this, uh, this link. Uh, uh, so, uh, this, um, uh, so this uh, article from Inigo Kiles, uh, he has uh, GLSL snippets that give you the distance from any point to the outline of a particular shape. Mm -hmm. So for, for the circle, it's going to return negative result for any point on the inside of this circle, and it's going to return a positive result, the distance from this point to uh, the closest point on this circle, right? Uh, the same goes for the uh, rounded boxes. The same goes for uh, rotated boxes. The same goes for the uh, rhombus or diamond, for the trapezoid and whatnot. So this is a great resource. Uh, even like you don't need to understand the exact math in here in order to be able to enjoy the uh, final result. So the final result in here, what I want to know specifically, is my point inside the rectangle or outside the rectangle, right? So inside the rectangle, I want to apply the blur. Outside the rectangle, I don't want to do anything as my first step. So technically, I don't need the distance itself. I only need to know if it's inside mm -hmm. or not. But what this function does, it also gives me the distance, negative or positive, and I am going to be using it for the drop shadow, uh, which will be uh, one of the next steps. Uh, so the next step, so the next step is 
to write, uh, to uh, create this um, uh, gradient outline. Again, it can be done as a shader, but in this particular case, it's much simpler, more straightforward, more kind of like easier. It's easier to reason what it does uh, to use one of the composed Canvas APIs. Uh, so I use draw around rect uh, and I use a linear gradient. Uh, and if you will notice, uh, if you look at the whole code, I use it outside of this uh, box. So the box that draws the, um, uh, sorry, the canvas that draws the, um, uh, the circles is the, is the canvas where I apply the blur. But I don't want to apply the blur on top of this uh, rounded um, uh, outline. So it is another canvas, which is kind of like, if you will, like there's a stack of two canvases, right? One where I apply the blur and the noise and one when, where I don't. And this one is where I do not. And so this is um, kind of like, uh, doesn't use directly anything from Skia, uh, doesn't use any shaders. Of course it does use Skia, it does use shaders under the hood, but not uh, when you just uh, read it or when you just write it. Uh, so this is the outline, and now I go back to the reason uh, to use that sign distance function. If you look closer here around this edge, around this corner and around this corner, what I want to do, I want to apply this drop shadow to kind of like create this uh, visual separation between the layers mm -hmm. to make it appear as if the card is not just in front of the circles, but it's kind of like floating on top of the circles. So what I do here is I say that if I'm on the outside, so if I'm on the outside, my distance to the shape is positive. If I'm within 30 pixels, I'm going to take my color, my original color, and I'm going to shift it towards black. By how much am I shifting it? I'm shifting it based on how far away it is from the edge. So pixels all the way close to the edge are a little bit darker. And then the drop shadow essentially fades out the further away uh, from the edge you move. So this is an example where uh, it is something that can be expressed in uh, how many lines? We have uh, three lines. So this is something that can be expressed with three lines of code. And it's going to be running on however many GPU cores you have uh, on your device in hopefully as optimized, well, uh, optimized way as possible. Uh, so that is the drop shadow. Uh, then uh, we have this um, almost radial gradient. So it starts as translucent white over here, and then it fades all the way to uh, uh, almost full transparency, which is, uh, I say how far away I am, um, essentially for every pixel inside this shape, I say how far away am I from this coordinate? And then based on uh, that distance, I, uh, uh, I choose the alpha, uh, which is um, uh, the alpha is uh, applied uh, over here. Uh, then I apply the noise. So the noise is um, very similar to if I go back in here. So this is the noise uh, that is uh, produced by one of the Skia APIs. So what I do in here is I'm using the Ski API to create the noise. Uh, I pass this shader as a child, let's say attribute parameter or shader. And then after I apply the, uh, after I apply that uh, translucent white gradient, I also apply a little bit of the noise. So overall, you can see that there's white gradient going from the top left corner all the way down into the bottom right but also as it is applied it also applied with a little bit of a texture with a little bit like you can say it's kind of like this frosted texture that creates a little bit of uh, physicality uh, a little bit of a connection between the pixels on the screen to how this credit card might look like uh, in your hands in your fingers and then finally these texts, these texts are just, um, well, just uh, calling draw text. Uh, it is a little bit, um, it is a little bit complicated because uh, Compose right now does not have a, an API to draw text. 
So what I'm doing here is you can either use a basic text composable to put a comp uh, to put some text on the screen, or you can use the underlying Skia APIs to draw the text directly on the canvas. In this case, you would go down to use uh, Kiko calls on the canvas. Uh, that's one option. Uh, or another option would be to say, I am going to use the basic text composable yeah. as a child of this canvas or as a child of this box. I'm going to position it so that it feels, right? So this comment that it's all smoke and mirrors. What you want to do is you want to create an illusion of a cohesive unit, right? But the way you implement it, you can use uh, Skia APIs, you can use uh, Skia shaders, you can use um, uh, compose uh, composables. Eventually, all the way down, it's pixels on the screen. A little bit above that, it's all shaders, right? And it's whatever you feel comfortable with, whatever you feel is the best tool for the job where the word best means maybe maintainable, maybe familiar to you, maybe uh, uh, the most performant, whatever you feel is um, the definition of the word best in this context. Got it. Well, <laughs> that was, uh, this is incredibly interesting to me, but also at the same time, vaguely scary. <laughs> yeah. Uh, vaguely. Vaguely, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, so like, you know, if like this was a certain revelation uh, revelation to me, uh, I think it was back in like 2003. Um, I never thought about this kind of like sitting down and thinking, okay, how it is done. But like, if you look in here, let's say open, uh, open preferences, there is no kind of like magic that makes this collection of pixels into a button. A button is something that looks like a rectangle, a rounded rectangle. It has a little bit of a color separation. It has maybe a drop shadow. Uh, it has maybe a rollover effect, a press effect. It reacts to the mouse. It reacts to the keyboard. It reacts to different accessibility events, right? But eventually, it's all pixels. So a Windows XP button, there is no magic that Windows XP does under the hood to make, to turn a collection of pixels into a button, right? So um, there is no magic here that makes this into a credit card. It's like you said in Twitch stream, it is smoke and mirrors combining these different effects to create the familiar appearance of a certain concept and by familiar, it might be from the physical world, from something in your pocket, something on your uh, something on your uh, desk, or it might be familiar because you are used to it from other apps on your device, other websites, whatever it might be, right? And so a toggle is familiar because you've already have experience with uh, some toggles. Uh, which might be a light toggle on my wall, or it might be a toggle in the uh, Android system settings. But a toggle on the screen all the way down to the pixels is just a carefully curated, hopefully careful, uh, carefully curated collection of pixels that looks and behaves, well, like a toggle. <laughs> Got it. Uh, Kirill, thank you a lot. This was an incredibly useful uh, explanation. Uh, I've certainly learned a lot uh, because I, I had a vague, like a high level idea and understanding of what a shader is, but not much more than that. Uh, and now I'm like, mm, what can I use this for? <laughs> um, well, and like yeah, I said, I mean, the lower down you go, the more everything becomes a shader. Yeah. I, yeah, I have but some... I wonder if at my level of life, uh, like wh where I where I live on my developer uh, life, if there are scenarios that you would advise to, uh, well, definitely uh, use the Easy Compose APIs as much as possible, and then go a bit below for something a bit fancier. W w I mean, this is this is cool, and definitely. Uh, but I wonder, could should I use it in uh, Android app? Could I do, for instance, the gradient? Right, I'm I'm used to do the gradient with the, you know, the like the XML kind of uh, child uh, way of doing it on Android. 
Uh, but I, I wouldn't think about using a, a shader to do a, a gradient on a, on a card. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so uh, let me just uh, switch back to Skype uh, so that I can see you guys. Mm -hmm. um, so the way I want to see it is that, yes, it is shiny, it is new, it is powerful, but I want to separate the shininess and the power of it from how well it is suited to any particular task. Right. So it's kind of like think that like what is a Turing complete language and what is a Turing machine, right? If you have this infinite tape that stretches all the way to the left and to the right, and all you can do is move one box to the left, one box to the right, look at if you have a zero or a, or one, like I don't want to go like too deep into like this. Like as long as the language is Turing complete, it doesn't really matter what kind of a language you are using, right? Why would you want to use Kotlin if you can do anything Kotlin does in Java or in JavaScript or in Go or in Dart or in C++ and whatnot, right? So the question becomes, what am I familiar with? What am I comfortable with? What is well supported by my tooling uh, infrastructure, right? What maybe my team is using? So I want to see shaders as yet another tool at my disposal. I want to know what it is good at. I want to know what are the weaker sides, maybe how difficult it is to debug, maybe how dense the code is, right? But I want to also know that sometimes, yes, I do want to drop down the level to the shaders as much as sometimes game developers drop all the way down to writing assembly code for the very specific uh, CPU architecture if they feel that it is uh, necessary if they feel that I want to squeeze every single ounce of performance out of it, because if I do blur in a software on an off-screen bitmap, it is going to uh, break my uh, frame rate. It is going to uh, consume a lot of resources. It is going maybe on, um, on a mobile platform. It is going to evict some other apps and kill them, right? And so I want to see it as a useful tool, but not as the tool to start chipping, like when I say it's shaders all the way down, doesn't mean that now you want to rewrite your entire Compose app as shaders, right? So the usefulness of higher level primitives is exactly the same as usefulness of higher level languages. We don't program in assembly anymore. Well, we like probably like 99% of professional developers out there, right? So the usefulness of higher level languages is the same usefulness of higher level Compose primitives. And if you want to drop down a level, it's great that we can in Android T and in Compose for desktop. Thinking about maybe some special effects you might want to do, then uh, sure, you might want to use shaders for that. And my, like, my, my mad idea at this point is, I don't know if you've ever played Mario Kart 8, but when you start a race, there is this giant button that shakes and does particle effects and does all sorts of things. It's like to give a big weight to the action of starting a race. So that maybe is something you could consider using a shader for, uh, but uh, definitely yes, not for it. all the buttons, right? Yeah, let me see if I can find it. I think shader toy, what was it? Infinite world in noise. I don't remember which one it was. Well, not this one. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Uh, let's see, bookmarks. Well, you're going to see all my bookmarks now. I can uh, move away if you want. Uh, there was something, I called it the Eye of Sauron. Let me see oh, if God. I can. Uh, can, you re, uh, can you remove my screen sharing? I'll find it quickly. Uh, and then, uh, yes, done. Back. Okay, yeah, let me just quickly find that Eye of Sauron. There's some really incredible shaders on Shader Toy. Some uh, really, see. really weird things. Ah, actually, it is in Slack, so let me go. I'll <laughs> open it in Slack, and then I'll ask sure. you to uh, share my uh, yeah, screen. Yeah, let again. me know when you want me to uh -huh. switch back. So let me do, so I go into. I'm going to try uh, and find uh, some weird shader in the meantime. Mm. Uh, here it is. Okay, so uh, oh, let's uh, let's uh, let's share it again. Yes. Oh. Okay. 
So I call this the Eye of Sauron. So like you can do this here, like this one, right? Oh. And so you can definitely have your button, like your primary button look like this, right? Kind of like enticing you to click on it, right? And uh, there's not a lot of code. There's about, what, 70 lines, uh, 70 lines of code in here, right? I try to understand what it is doing, but I kind of gave up. Uh, <laughs> but in general, like if you want this appearance on some very prominent element in your app, you are going to have hard time to make it performant by using higher level Android or Compose Canvas APIs. So in this particular case, you don't want the attractiveness or the effect to come at the expense of performance. And in this particular case, you probably, if you're absolutely sure that you want this effect, probably you do want to uh, uh, go to the lower level of writing this as a shader. Hmm. Yeah, I'm seeing all the weirdest things on, on shader. I'm just looking for a particle. There's so many particle effects that are incredible it's like you can simulate rain on your screen or something like that <laughs> uh, correct correct so uh you can say that uh let me go back to skype so you can see you uh so you can say that uh, shaders are great for something like um, image editor or video editor mm -hmm. where you can provide a collection of dozens and dozens of different filters and if you implement these filters in a performant way maybe with skier shaders then you can have a live preview uh, like, you know, you can drag left and right and see how the image looks like with and without the filter. Uh, maybe you can do it on, on top of the video. Maybe you can do some sort of a relaxation app where the app, uh, like, you know, shows you some sort of a landscape. Mm -hmm. And then it applies this, like, your rain filter, lightning. Well, lightning is not really relaxing. Like, it applies this uh, rain filter, wave filter, whatever it might be, right? So what you usually see on shader toy is something like super in your face, right? Not yeah. something subtle. Uh, I want to understand what I can do, but in a more subtle way, right? So if I look at this example of, um, where's my button? Button. So this is something subtle. So this glow around the uh, yellow button is subtle. It can definitely be achieved without a skier shader. And yet I felt like it was a great tool because I don't need to worry about extending the layout bounds of this button. I don't need to worry about somehow drawing this button by the parent or whatnot. It felt to me that this was the right tool, the most well-suited or a really well-suited tool uh, for this particular job. And this is right now what I'm looking for. Uh, in shaders. So if I look at these uh, textures, um, at these textures over here, maybe I want to apply this brushed metal shadow on the toolbar, or maybe on the status bar, or maybe somewhere that doesn't need to draw attention to itself, but it creates some sort of a visual separation of different parts of my UI to uh, help the user maybe um, find what they're looking for in a little bit more structured manner. Got it. Uh, I just realized we've gone over time, so I'm, uh, I'm afraid we have to wrap up, but we've okay, sure. done a gazillion things and uh, I'm, I'm still so, so very grateful for your uh, explanation of shaders. Uh, one day, one day I'll, I'll find the time to create a shader and then I'll, I will have to credit you for at least for the uh input <laughs> to to get me to do it um so kirill again thank you a lot uh, no, thank this you is me. super interesting for for folks that are interested in learning more about the stuff you're playing around with uh where can they follow you apart from your twitter which is down here right now and also uh, your so blog i have um a few years ago i have decided to remove myself from twitter in terms of uh, posting on there, uh, like not to go too deep into it, but it kind of like encourages very negative patterns of behavior in general. So I am a consumer of a very few uh, accounts, uh, but otherwise I am on uh, Slack, on Kotlin Lang uh, Slack in the, um, in the few um, uh, channels, uh, most specifically Compose-Desktop. Um, 
uh, is, um, I think, the best place to discuss um, uh, kind of like the desktop variant or the desktop flavor of Compose, but there are other channels in there, Compose and uh, getting started and whatnot. And uh, when I do post, I do post on my blog, pushingpixels.org, pushing-pixels.org. Uh, and I honestly do not see myself um, uh, going back to Twitter in a more, uh, I guess, producer capacity. Fair enough. And uh, there was a question here, what's the future of Aurora? So Aurora is um, kind of like the counterpart of Material. Uh, so Material is a design library. Um, and uh, Aurora is uh, another design library that has buttons, checkboxes, combo boxes, whatnot. Uh, and its main focus, well, its only focus is to provide the desktop experience to be optimized for um, the mouse, the keyboard interaction on larger screens. Yeah, because material right now is really no. Mm. Uh, well, it's, um, it is, um, I think it is very hard to create a design system that scales well on such different form factors and interaction factors as mobile and uh, desktop. So I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm saying it is a very hard thing. Uh, well, it is considerable, considerably hard thing to do. Uh, okay, so uh, let's close it down. Even do you have anything to say at the end? I don't remember if you used to say stuff at the end or not. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm here to give away stickers and licenses. Right. So let's right. run the, let's roll the die. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Let's see what uh, the boss says. Ba Boom! Mike, congratulations. Um, we are sending you, uh, well, uh, we are sending you um, a bunch of stickers and uh, IntelliJ Ultimate license. So that's uh, I think also something that you can use. Hmm? Mike is our latest uh, subscriber, well, member actually yeah. on Coffee. So supporter, supporter on Coffee. Thank you for the support, Mike. And that that paid off. I mean, you put some money in, you got like a, more <laughs> like a hundred fifty buck. So that's good karma. Um, so um, I'm gonna just reach out to you. No worries. Um, we have also a Telegram group. So just that I'm here. I'm also going to put the link for the rest of you that don't know that we have a Telegram group, so you can join us whenever you want. We are messing around uh, the whole day, <laughs> so that's a, that's a fun fun place to be. Um, and that's for, for my side. That was great. It was a lot of, uh, as, as they said in the chat, it's a bit demystified because now I have an idea, right? I, at least I have an, uh, an overview. Or what a shader is so yes, um, everything is a shader. A, <laughs> everything, everything is a shader. No, but, but that's shader. actually a good mindset and especially the shaders all down it's like turtles all down is shaders uh all the way down and i and i love it i love it because it it, it makes it makes a lot of sense and it makes it a bit more approachable for people that are not that familiar with uh like intense graphic stuff so Thank you. Thank you for this much information. Thanks for having me. So closing down, last two things. First thing, uh, if you are a subscriber uh, on the, I don't remember the, the tier names because I'm um, terrible at that, but if you have access to the Discord, uh, in a couple of minutes, I'm going to put the link there. We're going to try and do a clickbaity thumbnail for the YouTube video, as is now the tradition. We are resuming the tradition. Uh, and. Uh, Apart uh, after that, so next week we're gonna have our friend uh, Yasin from the Google team, uh, and Yasin is gonna talk to us about modern storage, uh, which I think Ivan is now a big, f uh, big fan of. Uh, yeah, and, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a nice library. We use it at work. It solved me a problem at work. So big fan. And the Wednesday after, we're gonna be celebrating our first year of streaming, which is crazy if I think about it. But come, because we have a bunch of surprises for you. I have no idea what we're going to do. My current plan is to order a pizza and eat it with you folks. <laughs> so you're going to see me like, ah, I eat a pizza. <laughs> but um, yeah, we're going to have a big giveaway of a bunch of uh, 
fancy stuff and uh, yeah oh yes obviously this sunday uh we're gonna be off because uh it's uh, easter uh not that i am religious but it's a holiday so we don't do streams on holidays and the week after i will be at android makers in paris so if you're gonna be there find me i have stickers uh and if you're not gonna be there then well uh See you at the next conference, I hope. Uh, that said, thank you again to everyone that joined us back after our long uh, break. I got a new house in the meantime. A lot of things happened. Uh, and thank you a lot, Kirill, for uh, your time and your, your help and explanations. See you all you. next Wednesday. Bye. Go.